Good afternoon and welcome to this session entitled Patient-Centric Approaches to Managing Venous Leg Ulcers, an interdisciplinary case-based discussion. This presentation is supported by an educational grant from 3M Healthcare Medical Solutions Division. I'm Susie Eamon and I'm a clinical specialist at Atrium Health Stanley. And today, along with my colleagues, Dot Weir and Dr. Lucian Vlad, we'll be your speakers and presenters, but we look forward to answering your questions after the presentation. We also encourage you to ask us questions throughout, and then together, we're gonna to find the answers at the end. Our faculty disclosures are listed here for your reference. as well as the learning objectives. In short, our goal today is to stimulate a discussion about the utilization of compression and mechanically powered negative pressure wound therapy in order to optimize wound healing. So let's get started. I'm excited about starting us off with a discussion of compression and how you select, implement, and optimize your therapy choices. Compression is beneficial, not only for circulation, and integumentary health, it helps us to heal our wounds. But realize that not just any compression will do. We need to make sure that the compression that we're applying is therapeutic. So as a way to remember the things that add to the therapeutic effect of compression, I've come up with this an acronym, RAP. W stands for working pressure. R stands for reliable application. A for adaptability. And P stands for patient-specific compliance. Sometimes I just like to say compression needs to be people-friendly, both for our patients as well as for our clinicians. Let's break these down. So when we're talking about therapeutic compression, what is most important is that we talk about developing therapeutic pressures underneath that compressive application. Now remember, it's not just about the pressure when you apply the wrap. Perhaps more important is the pressure when your patient moves or when your patient, patient changes positions. So remember, it's two pressures that we need to think about. The resting pressure, we want it to be low so that the compression wrap is comfortable. For the working pressure, we want it to be a high working pressure. We know that the literature recommends that you have at least 40 to 60 millimeters of mercury as a therapeutic resting pressure in order to have a hemodynamic response. Now you may say, how do we achieve that therapeutic working pressure range? And that's by compression selection. We need to make sure that we're picking textiles that will provide us with that dynamic working pressure range. Literature has shown us that multi-layer applications are more effective than a single layer, and that a compressive product that creates a short stretch inelastic profile produces a statistically significant hemodynamic effect. So this is pictured here in this diagram. On your left, you see that a product that is highly elastic creates a very minimal change when it comes to working pressure. Whereas the graph on the right shows a product that is inelastic creates a significantly greater rise in pressure when the patient moves or changes position. And this is where the money is. This is where the magic in compression occurs when you get this uh, alteration in pressure that micro-massage that occurs because of that pressure change. That creates therapeutic compression. R stands for reliable application. Dr. Hugo Parch says it best that the main obstacle to better also healing in our community is not the lack of good materials. There's good products that are out there, but rather it's the lack of information and training of our medical staff and patients to use the existent, existing materials properly. So it was a really interesting study to demonstrate this, that they looked at over 1,300 skilled clinicians and they observed and tested their knowledge as well as their skill set. Can you believe that only 10% of those 1,300 skilled clinicians had knowledge with regards to multi-component compression systems? Only, only 10%. And probably more disturbing was that when they looked at the practical application skill of clinicians, only 12% were able to achieve the target range. So this means that when we're picking our compression products, it is key that we train staff in the proper application and use of these compression products. 
Keller did a study that showed with a single session of training that there was a statistically significant improvement in the ability of the staff to apply compression within the therapeutic target range. In addition, when you're picking your compression products, you want to make sure that those compression products are easy to apply for your staff. In addition, that those products stay in place and don't slide down. For me, it's about matching the compression product to your patient's presentation, as well as timing your follow-up. If you have a patient that has a large limb and there's a lot of edema, you may need to bring that patient back in order to reapply that application in order to maintain that working pressure and maintain that reliable application. A stands for adaptability. Therapeutic compression demands that we match our patient's presentation to the product. Our patients come in all different shapes and sizes and tissue textures. And as a result, they require different compression applications. So for instance, the lady that you see on the left has a very fatty, spongy limb. She requires something that gives her a little bit more structure, a multi-layer lymphedema wrap. The gentleman in the middle, again, not a lot of tissue there, not a lot of edema, but you can see that the highly elastic uh, stockinette actually is creating a tourniquet because it's digging into its tissue. Again, better containment with a two-layer cohesive product. And finally, I'm sure you've had the example of the large limb that comes in. This limb is large, it's heavy, it's well over 100 centimeters in circumference. It requires a highly structured, stiff product that can provide large working pressures as well as a large resting pressure. This is a lobule assist system with a Velcro closure. So again, when we talk about adaptability, we're matching our compression product to different limb shapes and sizes, as well as different body parts. Sometimes you have to be a little creative. So it pictured here is again, I can't take credit for it. This is my colleague, Aaron Fazari, came up with the idea of using a Velcro adjustable wrap in order to address the swelling and to promote better circulation and better wound healing for this medial thigh wound in an amputee. You've got your toe swelling, you need to get good compression to that amputation site. And simply by modifying your compression choice and then incorporating it into a more traditional two layer system, you get better wound healing. As well, we need to get rid of these highly elastic products that you see, these single layer products, preferentially applying a product that you can adapt to cover the whole limb in order to get a better therapeutic outcome. So again, picking your products and then adapting your product to your patient's presentation. And last, probably most important, we need compression that's people friendly. Patient comfort is number one. If a patient says it's too tight, it's too tight. It doesn't mean that you should throw compression out altogether. It just means that you might need to choose a different compression product. Let's see a couple of examples. So here you see again, a highly elastic product, patient complaining of it being too tight. Clearly can you see the tourniquet effect? Simply by applying a different compression product, this here's a flat knit garment, significantly better containment of the limb and the patient is much more comfortable. Additionally, you can see again, another example of a highly elastic product creating trauma to a limb, finding a product, a two layer cohesive here to give us better containment produces a significantly improved patient outcome and patient comfort. As well, we need to make sure to remember that compression is a continuum. There are a lot of different options that are out there. Certainly there are adjustable wraps, you can combine different compression products. Here you see a longitudinal elastic stockinette on top with a two layer cohesive on the bottom, as well as layering of different products in order to meet the needs of your patient. So let's look at this, I call it wrap in action. Let's take all of these factor, factors and apply it to a real life patient presentation. So again, what we're looking for when we're looking for a compression product to give us a working pressure of 40, 60, 40 to 60 millimeters of mercury, that product should be stiff with a low resting pressure so that it's comfortable to the patient, but a high working. We need a product that will give us reliable application that's gonna stay in place and give us consistent pressure over time. It needs to be adaptable because you can see even before we describe the patient, she has full leg issues. We need to find a product that can actually cover the entire area. 
And for, finally, it needs to be pre people friendly. So let's look a little bit closer at this patient scenario. So again, if we look a little closer at the limb, this is the lady who presented at the middle of January with a chronic presentation of on and off cellulitis, weeping stasis dermatitis on her lower leg, but also on her upper leg. This had been going on for well over six weeks. You can see that we're not doing a good job with, the do with regards to edema management here, as she's got that weeping stasis area in the front with the denuded area. So what we need to do is good wound bed prep. We clean this leg up, did a good job to remove any of the devitalized tissue, including the scales. And then we applied a texture product to the entire limb. We've got a product to absorb our exudate. And then we applied a two layer cohesive. In this case, we applied it from the toes to the knee and then from the knee to the thigh, all the way up on the right leg and from the toes to the knee on the left. We had the patient come back for an additional three visits and over a five day period, this is what we get. It's magic, right? You pick the right compression and it can happen. I also want to encourage you, don't forget the benefits of compression for those others. So again, you have the orthopedic patient, elective procedure, weeping wound with just some basic two layer compression of the full leg in less than a week, the incision is completely healed and the patient's pain is significantly less. Again, you've got your orthopedic trauma here, apply good compression. You can still continue with your rehabilitation, but you get complete wound closure. I wanna mention not to miss out on the benefit of positive pressure wound therapy. My colleagues are gonna to talk to you about negative pressure wound therapy, but remember compression can be thought of as positive pressure wound therapy. Compression enhances circulation. It improves the skin. It promotes wound healing. There's power in compression. Don't forget the benefits of compression for those other folks. And so here I have one last example of the use of compression with, boot, with burns. So you can see his initial presentation after the burn itself. He presented to me, his pain was 10 out of 10 and he had significantly limited range of motion of his knee. With simple application of a two layer cohesive product from the toes to the knee, he came back in 24 hours with a 50% with a reduction in his pain and an improvement in his range of motion. And well under just one week, we were able to achieve complete closure of this wound, complete resolution of his pain, complete healing. There's power in compression. So help me, it's time for that compression revolution and we need you. Remember that compression is multidimensional. Edema reduction is via the venous and the lymphatic enhancement. Compression can be used to restore the integument, to heal the wound, but also heal the skin. And remember that compression is not static. Dynamic changes in pressure is what we need to make compression more effective. We need to have more study to look at the impact of different compression, compression profiles to see the impact. Compression is not just for chronic venous insufficiency or venous leg ulcers, and it's not just for legs. My references are listed here, and I look forward to answering your questions. I'm gonna turn it over to Dot and let her give you a little bit more information about negative pressure wound therapy. Well, thanks, Susie. Uh, that was awesome. You know what, it's, I, just when I think I know a lot about compression wraps. I listened to someone like Susie and I realized she's forgotten more than I'll probably ever know. But anyway, I always enjoy hearing her speak. So anyway, my name's Dot and I will be now talking about uh, the holistic approach to taking care of patients who have venous leg ulcers and begin to talk about the use of mechanically powered negative pressure wound therapy. As we do this, as we look at using any kind of treatment on any kind of patient, we need to know the cause of the wound. Uh, the cause of the wound may be because of edema, but the diagnosis of the wound is really important, the etiology, so that we are 100% sure uh, about what we're treating and what kind of support that they might need. Of course, when we look at the different kinds of wounds that we commonly see in chronic wound care, of course, the venous patient, the diabetic patient, you know, the two most common wounds that we see, you know, certainly compression, certainly offloading um, and being assured that there's no osteo. Uh, and you can read the rest of this. But the biggest thing I like to point out is just because something looks like a venous leg ulcer, 
and it is surrounded by hemosiderin staining, if it's not responding to the things that you know are, are appropriate, we have to have a low threshold for biopsy because they can undergo some changes over time. And we certainly don't want to miss a diagnosis of like some sort of tissue cancer um, that, that we should have gotten. So anyway, I just like to always set the stage with that. So regardless of the wound type, we're going to need to know the flow to the, to the extremities so we can safely take care of them. And of course, we're going to do some sort of a bedside, initial bedside vascular evaluation. And as even as a nurse, as we bring in brand new patients, you know, I first start this and then the, usually the provider comes in and does it again. But we always want to be on the same page in terms of what we think that their perfusion is. Many times our fingers will lie to us. We may feel our own pulse, so just a palpating a pulse is not enough. And many of these folks have so much edema, you may not be able to feel the pulse anyway. So we wanna look at other, other ways that we can assess. Look at capillary refill. Is it, it, it should be less than three seconds. It should be a brisk refill when we press on the toe or the nail bed. Uh, of course, so many people wear nail polish, so it's hard to see, but so the, looking at the plantar aspect of the toe to look to see if you've got a nice brisk refill. If it's delayed and it seems to take forever for that white spot to go away, then of course we want to look further. We can obviously see people almost as soon as we come in the room with these dramatic changes in the color of their legs when they're in a dependent position. So looking at just this patient right here, uh, we um, had him up with his legs elevated and you can see just in a, in a span of one to two minutes when he dropped that leg down, you can see that dependent rumor that occurred. Again, a classic sign that there are vascular problems. So many of us are going to do a bedside ABI in order to feel good about using some sort of compression on the patient. We do them, but we pretty much send most of our patients to vascular. Uh, they have the equipment, they can get good um, evaluations of these folks' extremities. Uh, because as you know, especially if someone has diabetes, the uh, um, ankle brachial index may not be uh, accurate. So we look for a high one many times to say, oh wow, it's probably calcified vessels in the distal arteries. Um, uh, and the toes don't calcify, so we want to do TBIs, which I'll show you next. But what if it is perfect? What if it's a one? Is it a one because they have perfect circulation, or is it, an, uh, again, falsely elevated? So we never want to rely on just ABIs in the patient who has diabetes. In the patient with not, that's non-diabetic, they would be fine. So uh, when we look at the vascular testing options, of course, ABIs and TBIs, there are certainly other um, uh, vascular studies that can be done, and that's where we use our vascular colleagues in order to help determine what's the best testing to tell us the vascular status of our patient. <clears throat> but a TBI is what we want to order. If you're sending a patient for vascular studies, specifically arterial Dopplers, where you want um, you want to know that uh, they, uh, what their ABI is, be sure to ask for a TBI. Many vascular labs, if they don't do this a lot, uh, may not do the TBI for you. So you may have to order that specifically for your patient with diabetes. Then we're gonna see the telltale signs on patients' legs that have venous disease. Um, I picked the two pictures of the deepest, darkest hemosiderin staining um, that I could find uh, because of the <clears throat> dilation of the capillaries and the seepage of, of uh, fluid and blood components out into the tissues. They almost get like a tattoo. And so many patients say, you know, when is this gonna go away? And unfortunately, we have to tell them it probably won't. There are laser treatments, believe it or not, that could be done if it's a big issue for someone, but most of them, it's a life sentence. But again, a classic example of what we may see with the patient with uh, advanced venous uh, disease. Lipodermatous sclerosis is that <clears throat> progressive replacement of the skin and the subcutaneous tissue by the fibrous tissue. And it's what gives these folks that really narrow ankle and the very large calf. Uh, sort of the inverted champagne bottle look. Um, and when it's first happening, it can be quite painful. They may have some, uh, some erythema, red hot tender leg, and uh, many times it's going to be mistaken for, um, for uh, uh, some sort of cellulitis. But as the time goes by and when they get into the more chronic phase, it is this very classic look to um, to the, to the leg. And then, you know, as, as Susie and everybody who talks about lymphedema uh, always points out, you can't have all of that fibrotic tissue 
uh, in that lower extremity and not have as some, some um, lymphatic involvement. So it's always going to be a, a, a combination disease, especially when they get to this point. So the other thing that we deal with so much in, in taking care of patients with venous disease are those uh, patients that have the eczema or what is commonly called stasis dermatitis. It's this patchy changes to their skin, very um, flaky, scaly, <clears throat> drying, uh, very possibly could lead to a, a superficial infection. But again, if they do turn red, you know, most of the time it just needs to be topically treated, like maybe with triamcinolone or, or something. But many times, again, they'll be admitted to the hospital <clears throat> um, with the uh, presumptive diagnosis of cellulitis when really they just needed to uh, begin to have their venous disease treated. And then lastly, and one of my favorite things to talk about are these scales. If I could see your, uh, your hands raised and I said, who likes to pick these scales up? I bet half of you would raise your hands because this is something we need to work to get rid of to continue to treat uh, these patients without working towards descaling them is, is in the long run not gonna be a lot of help. But also consider what is hiding underneath those scales. It's likely to have a lot of bacteria and so they can be cross-contaminating or, or contaminating their wound um, as a result of the peri-wound um, scales. So work to get them off the, you can peel them off. I mean, it's, it's something that we don't want patients picking at themselves but we work very, very hard to get these scales off. Because when you do that, you know, if you just answer this question in your mind, do you wanna treat scales like with an emollient or moisturizing, or even if you are gonna use a steroid cream, you wanna treat scales or do you wanna treat skin? So let's work really, really hard to get those legs free of all those scales so that we can get down to the skin um, and treat it. And the itching is so much lessened when we are able to descale these patients. So there are monofilament pads that you can use, gauze sometimes will do it, but uh, again, it doesn't have to happen overnight, but it's something that we should be working towards, particularly in the peri-wound area so that we can reduce the potential contamination. So then the ulcerations, again, are get down to what we really see so much of. We don't always get the patients who have intact legs with no ulceration, but you've got uh, either skin that's dying faster than that then can be replaced with that fibrous tissue. The skin becomes necrotic and then it leads to the ulceration. Or it could be some minor injury that the patient didn't even know occurred. They could have reached down and scratched their leg. They could have scratched it with the toenail on the other leg when they were put on when they were sleeping. But also we see a lot of things that are the result of minor injuries, um, falling, uh, golf carts. I used to practice in Florida, so <laughs> we saw rare number of people that got injured from playing golf. Dog chains, dishwasher doors are a common one. And so a little bump on the leg that is really of no consequence can lead to major ulcers. So when we look at treating these folks, we know what the requirements are for wound healing. We need to get them clean. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. We need to manage their bio burden. Uh, we need to balance the moisture and we're going to you know, wanna make sure we get the edema down and then manage to any inflammation that they have. So normal wound healing, uh, it, these are the things that we always address as we address any kind of wound. But wound med preparation is a critical piece of what we do. And Louis Pasteur said, chance favors the prepared mind. And so I took a little creative liberty with this and I say, chance favors the prepared wound. And uh, it's cleansing the wound, getting good debridement done and bacterial control is, uh, is how we're going to get these patients on the right kind of trajectory. The wound bed preparation is just restoring the balance. It helps us, give us, us a platform to organize our medical procedures so we get them to the right point. Uh, the ultimate aim, of course, is to have good granulation tissue. In order to get to that, we're going to have to have a, a wound that's clean and free of necrotic tissue. And so uh, it's really just optimizing the host and optimizing the wound environment in prepar either to heal on their own or in preparation for um, more therape other therapeutic measures as we're gonna be talking about today. And that is negative pressure wound therapy. So when we think about those requirements for wound healing that I just mentioned, 
negative pressure when therapy, and Dr. Vlad's gonna be talking more about this, really contributes most of that. It helps to promote the formation of good granulation tissue and wound contraction helps to remove waste off the surface of the wound and replace it with normal wound uh, exudate to create a better environment for healing. It helps to create certainly a moist environment. Uh, importantly, and I'm gonna talk again about this, it helps to reduce peri wound edema, and then uh, it helps to promote perfusion, and I think Dr. Vlad's gonna mention that too. So it's just a way to, to really get us uh, um, on the right healing trajectory. So I would submit to you though, that it's become routine care. For many of our patients who have larger ulcers, such as pressure injuries, um, uh, larger defects in their skin, we most often think first to go to negative pressure wound therapy for that. But there are some other reasons to use negative pressure wound therapy, venous leg ulcers being one of them. But if you just look at this patient here, this was one of the, I used to say this was one of the worst vasculitis cases that I've ever taken care of, but actually under our care right now is probably one that was worse. But he had a, finally had a skin graft, and this is the leg, this is his foot after he had negative pressure for five days. This was that graft at 11 days. And I would tell you, I doubt you could get as good a take uh, with any other method of bolstering than negative pressure wound therapy. And so uh, the negative pressure will do a lot more for us than just the big wounds that have big defects to fill in that we have come ac really accustomed to using it for. So we have had negative pressure since, like, since the third decade, since the mid '90s, and so we, you know, we had the larger machines that you could just use in hospitals, and then they came out with the smaller, more portable machines, um, as you see in the bottom left picture. But there was still a gap. There was still a need for something that was more patient friendly and lifestyle friendly. Patients still needed to work. Mobility was still is a concern. Of course, we don't want people falling. And when you're having, if you're going through rehab, like walk, learning to walk with a walker or a cane, and you've got something on your shoulder that could make you unstable, uh, it just makes you a fall risk. The redundant tubing that's attached to some of the power devices also could become a fall risk. So it, that becomes a problem. Uh, it was a, a, a noise problem for, for some because some of the machines make a little bit of a whirring noise that uh, uh, is embarrassing if you're out at church, if you're at school, if you are out, just out anywhere um, outside of your home. And it is something, as you see in that top middle picture, that does interrupt people's sleep. So there was still a need for something different. And so back in uh, the early, to back in like 2010, the first portable negative pressure, excuse me, the wearable negative pressure device was developed in the form of one that was mechanically powered um, uh, that uh, really made a difference in people's lifestyles. So the mechanically powered negative pressure wound therapy device, as you see here, is one of them. And it combines a, an advanced wound care dressing because it's a hydrocolloid, thin hydrocolloid dressing with the uh, uh, negative pressure device that is a cartridge that works on a spring. I'm going to show it to you in a moment. Um, it doesn't work with any power. It doesn't have to have any batteries. So one of the things that when we talk about venous disease is that we, we have to get rid of edema. And of course, we work to getting rid of edema with compression. But one of the things I personally feel about um, negative pressure in general, but certainly when we're talking in an ambulatory population, the mechanically powered one is perfect for this, is that it removes local edema so that you, you enhance the, the healing that can take place um, as you also compress the leg. So this is just a cartoony kind of picture that I made. So when you have normal tissue, the capillaries feeding those tissues are pretty close together. And so the distance diffusion, the, the distance that oxygen has to travel is at, an, is at a minimum. So uh, perfusion is going to be good. When you have uh, tissues that are full of fluid, then those vessels, those little capillaries are spread out. The distance that the oxygen has to, has to transport in order to get to the tissues is going to be greater. And so, Anytime you have increased volume, the density of the vessels is gonna be less and you're going to not have as good a perfusion. So getting rid of certainly leg edema, but also local tissue edema right around the wound is a big benefit. So this is what this particular um, mechanically powered device looks like. It works uh, on a, a constant force spring. You can't see it, it's up here in this housing here, but it's, it's coiled 
um, springs, metal springs, that work like a plunger on a syringe. And once it is activated using a key that comes with it, then it begins to just do, uh, pull a little bit of gentle force on, on, the, um, on the foam interface that's in the wound, and, um, uh, and, and it creates the negative pressure in that manner. And so uh, the, there is no um, alarm, there's no noise, and so the only thing that you can see is a visual indicator of um, uh, a red line that will show at the end of the cartridge, and that's what we have to teach our patients in terms of using it. So you've seen this picture before. So this is the, uh, the hydro colloid dressing. It's very thin. It has a centimeter grid on it. Uh, it comes in several sizes, but you can cut them down. You just want at least two centimeters around the, past the edge of the foam. The tubing is great because you can cut it to fit so that it um, uh, is not loose and hanging and potentially a fall risk. And then there's a little valve that attaches to the cartridge that prevents the um, exudate from refluxing out of the cartridge and, and back up the tubing. So it's very lightweight, it's 1.1 kilogram. I mean, it's, you can barely feel it when it has no fluid in it and then even when it's full, it's not very heavy. Um, there is 125 millimeters of mercury that is being exerted with those coiled springs and they do also come with 100 as well as 75, but we just generally stock the 125. We have never really felt the need for uh, the, the lower ones. Um, it comes in a 60 millimeter cart milliliter cartridge as well as a 150. And we've had a few patients lately that the 150 came in very handy. So it is only continuous. You can't do any kind of intermittent um, uh, um, therapy with this. Uh, and there again, there is no alarm. So they have to keep an eye out for that red, um, that red line. But what's nice about it is there is no power. So it's kept in place with a strap. And um, what I do is I give people two straps because it's a totally closed system. And so they can walk right into the shower with the strap on and then um, take the shower and then take off the wet strap and put a dry one on. So it really enhances their quality of life because people want to shower. And they don't have to take it apart. The only time they have to take that apart is that they're going into a hyperbarics chamber because uh, even though um, it's waterproof, it is not hyperbarics proof. It has a lubricant and a metal coil. So you have to take all the plastics off and then um, reconnect it after they get out. And the other thing that comes with it or, or you can purchase with it is, is a secure ring that when you, and you can see how it goes on here, that eliminates any wrinkles. Um, this is a hydrocholate dressing, so it's not like the drape that we're used to where we can seal it up easily with another piece of drape. And so on a curved area, there will be, you may get some wrinkles. And so as long as you're using the secure ring, then you can, and as long as you're nice and smooth right inside here, then none of these wrinkles make a difference. They're not gonna come into play at all and, uh, and um, interfere with the adhesion. So a couple years ago, this was published in 2019, I think they met in 2018, a panel of experts that had had a lot of experience with mechanically powered uh, negative pressure got together. And I would suggest looking this up to, to see what their recommendations are. But they, they talked all, all around the whole thing. They talked about the coding guidelines. It is covered. Uh, in uh, outpatient wound care centers as well as in home care. And there are some rules there, so, so you can find out about that. Um, they have lots of recommendations about picking the patient, picking the wound, how to train the patient. Anyway, it's a, it's a, very, um, a very comprehensive and, and good document to have if you're going to use this therapy uh, to help guide our practice, plus to educate your staff. So one of the things that they, um, the, they looked at the, the patient characteristics. So for those for disposable or those people who are mobile, um, including wheelchair bound, but someone that you don't wanna have to worry about the power system hanging on the chair or hanging on their shoulder or being in their lap or falling out of that chair. Uh, people who are in rehab, people who are walking, people who work. There's many people, it, it's hidden underneath your clothing. You can't see it, you can't hear it, so people can continue to go to work. Um, Someone who's been in the, in the power system, but their exu date has become less, their wounds has become smaller, then they're a good, uh, good candidate. Um, someone who's power impaired, someone who's homeless, who have limited access to electricity. Um, if, there's, if there's a power outage, you know, the, uh, then this is something that someone could be transitioned into until the power came back on. Um, but mostly it's just 
from a quality of life standpoint, someone who wants to socialize and be without an external device hanging on their on their shoulder. So as far as cautioning against certain patients, uh, people who have dementia, um, they're more likely to pick and play and take apart the dressing, but mostly they want to always take apart the cartridge. Um, people who are combative that may not be able to follow your instructions to look at the, at the visual indicator, um, someone who doesn't have any caregiver support, and obviously someone who's blind or colorblind who wouldn't be able to know that they needed to, uh, to check that cartridge. As far as the wound recommendations, it's just mostly size and uh, exudate. date. Uh, if it's uh, greater than 18 by 18 square centimeters, then you, you probably want to stick with the powered until it gets a little bit smaller. And really, it's an amount of exudate over a week's time. Um, uh, the recommendation is if it's less than eight, these are 60 cc cartridges. So really, and the recommendation for changing the mechanically powered is twice a week. And so uh, they can really, if they can have about 120 cc's of exudate or less, uh, where two cartridges would do it, um, then, then that would be great. I don't have the cases in here because they're very recent, but we, we have had a couple of people lately that we have had a tremendous amount of exudate, and we just, we had to use a lot more cartridges, but we did that in order to get, the wounds were small and they were ambulatory, so we were able to use it to get their wound under control. Um, if, if the exudate is, is very thick, very viscous, they might do better with something that's going to pull it through with power. Um, something that's a little bit more routine uh, um, in terms of infection or, or pathology, and then uh, a place where it can be offloaded because the port for this is right at the dressing. Now, there is a bridge dressing, so you can use it on the bottom of somebody's foot, but the port, um, uh, if, that's, if you don't have the bridge dressing, the port may come into play because it's right in the center of the dressing. So in closing, the, you know, the, the use of mechanically powered negative pressure isn't going to take away our power systems. We're not going to not use those. But because I'm in ambulatory care, I've been in outpatient wound care centers for 20 years and currently work in Saratoga Springs, New York. i um, been here just for about six months and love it. But uh, so, so we still use our power systems. But for our younger or for our ambulatory population and, and even our elderly uh, who we, we worry about falling, um, we have found this to be such a great augment to, to their quality of life and their safety. So you can use it in special populations if you just want to use it. The, the thing about the power systems is it's a monthly rental. And if you only need it for a week or uh, if you're gonna put it on top of a skin graft, a recipient site, and you just need it for five days, then they're still gonna pay for a month. Um, it's, it helps to beef up the surface of a wound before you're gonna put, and I've got a case here, before you're gonna put on a, um, a uh, may have bioengineered tissue of some kind or sterile and tissue-based product. Uh, for skin grafts, for smaller, um, uh, deeper wounds, you can put it into a deep wound. Uh, it comes with an adequate amount of foam. Um, power source, I've already mentioned. But it's important that you are, you are taught how to use it. We all learned how to use negative pressure at the beginning, and we fumbled our way through, but we've all become very good at it. And we have little tips and little tricks that we use when we're using the powered system and a drape. With this one, you're going to want to be coached and have a little experience with it. Once you do, your creativity comes right out again and you can, uh, you'll, be, you'll be fine with it. And you'll find yourself doing really interesting little things with it in order to put it into smaller, harder to reach areas. So I'm gonna finish with just a few uh, cases. Um, this is a gentleman who is one of our early ones that we ever used it on, and he was 43 years old. He worked two jobs to support his family. He worked at Walt Disney World. He worked at 7-Eleven. And so he came in uh, with a trauma, but he, his venous disease kept him from closing. And so this is when he first came in, and then uh, after we uh, debrided him, after a couple of weeks of negative pressure, it still wasn't going anywhere. And so we said, are you using the negative pressure? And he said, when I was home. Uh, so he worked two jobs. He could not at Walt Disney World use uh, uh, the powered system and certainly not at the 7-Eleven. So he only was connecting to power when he got home. So he continued to work. He hid the system in his pocket. Five weeks later, we had stopped the um, the the power system and it wasn't doing anything. I hope you can appreciate his volume was down in his leg, but we started the mechanically powered and four weeks later, we were able to stop it. He was completely filled in. You can just see a little divot there and then that's his last visit. So again, enabled us to deliver negative pressure and continue to allow him to work. 
This is a gentleman who we were actually in one of the RCTs for this device, and he had been one of our study patients, and this is a recurrent ulcer for him. So he came back in, uh, he, he's unsteady, he'd had a stroke as a very young man, and so he walked with a walker, he's very unsteady, high fall risk. So we were taking care of him and trying to get this to, to be under control, and it was very, very painful for him. So he's the one that said, can't we just use that thing again, <laughs> that, that, that uh, uh, snap again? And so we did, and after two weeks of therapy, his wound looked better, it felt better, and um, uh, we uh, were able to then go on to um, using a cellular and tissue-based product. So uh, again, the patient asked for it because he had had it before. And then this is the fellow who is in our practice that uh, just, uh, just finished healing him out about um, three weeks ago or four weeks ago. 62-year-old guy, he had type 2 diabetes. He works in a box store, in an appliance store, and he was uh, taking a dishwasher off of a forklift or something, and it fell and just slid down his leg. And so he went to the emergency department. He had a big old hematoma. And uh, when he, we saw him, he had only been using antibiotic ointment. So this was his initial visit. We evacuated the hematoma. We ordered the uh, powered system. And so we started the powered system and uh, that's day one. And then uh, well, that's day four uh, of his wounding, not his powered system. On day 15, we started the powered system and he, he got 10 days into it, but he really wanted to go back to work, to think about going back to work. I don't know why I, I, he would want to be around those, those dishwashers again, but anyway. So we switched him over to the mechanically powered. You can see the um, a little over almost 12 square centimeters. This is the device in place. And he just loved it after having had the, uh, the power system. So that was on day 25. This is uh, after two dressing changes, this is day 32 on the left, then on the right, day 36. And then um, uh, we stopped the mechanically powered at day 32. And then he, uh, at day 41, he was doing very, very well. He did return to work. And, um, and then he, he went on to completely close. So with that, I, I appreciate you listening to me and, and uh, talking to you about venous leg ulcers as well as begin to talk about the mechanically powered negative pressure wound therapy. So now I'd like to turn it over to my friend, Dr. Luke Vlad, to continue talking about it. Thank you. Hello, friends and colleagues. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dad. Uh, thank you, Susie. It's been a, a great uh, presentation so far. Uh, I'm Dr. Vlad. It's such an honor for me to present along uh, Dad and Susie. I'm a family medicine trained physician. I am uh, part of uh, faculty of plastic surgery department, Wake Forest. And I'm very proud to be in the same department with the inventors of the wound, like Dr. Argenta and uh, Dr. Uh, Mari Kwa. Um, I'm actually bringing here one of the uh, old slides that I have borrowed from my uh, department colleagues, which shows the effects of the wound vac here. Uh, what are we trying to bring to our patients? Uh, we know. Uh, what we're pursuing is promotion of granulation tissue, improve vascularity, recruitment of the tissue and uh, decreasing of bacteria count. Very important to decrease edema, especially for venous leg ulcer patients. When we use the wound back on <clears throat> burn wounds, we inhibit the progression of this wound to uh, extend into especially the peri wound uh, uh, damage. Uh, stimulation of the stress uh, protein synthesis. We re we're removing toxins and when we use the wound vac on grafted area, we're expediting engraftment of those. Um, this is probably one of the most important slides of my presentation, that, which describes the mechanisms of uh, the wound vac. Uh, you can see here this uh, sub-atmospheric pressure. Uh, what is that? That's actually one of the original terms that we were trying to, to implement for this therapy when it was brought to market 20-some uh, uh, years back. Because think about negative pressure, it doesn't exist. So, uh, however, the, the terms of negative pressure wound therapy stuck and uh, that's what this is going to call. But this, that's what this is going to be named. But all of these uh, words on these slides have been thoroughly and uh, uh, detailed, studied, improvement of the blood flow, edema controlled, mechanical tissue stimulation at the macro level, at the micro level, removal of the fluid and mediators and the decreased bacteria. Um, the original paper that presented some of these uh, uh, mechanism of actions was published in 1997 and we take these things for granted uh, nowadays. 
but uh, see, this is where we actually have established the parameters at uh, uh, negative 125 millimeters mercury. We have best improvement or uh, increase of the blood flow in the tissue. This uh, uh, goes any lower, don't have much an effect, it goes higher, and about 400 millimeters of mercury actually causes a sensation of blood flow into that tissue. So, um, uh, after the you know, original publication, there was literally an explosion, and this therapy was embraced, and everybody who deals with wound care uh, is familiar with, uh, with this therapy. Um, the technology has evolved, so from um, pre uh, archaic and uh, large charge mach machines, it has gotten subsequently smaller so that it's better accepted by the patients and it's got different form factors to, to be more friendly and it's gotten smarter. It, we have some uh, evolution of machines into the installation therapy that uh, this is larger for inpatient use and we have specialized machine for um, incision management. Uh, there's other companies that uh, are bringing this prior to the market, but what we're here to talk about today is the uh, the, the SNAP device, which is the the first and the only one I'm aware of uh, mechanical negative pressure wound therapy device, and it, it is the most uh, patient friendly device so far. Um, go, going back to the mechanics of the of the VAC system, think about a prescription for a wound vac. What you put on the surface of the wound determines which of the uh, mechanism of actions it involves. So we're thinking that the uh, most important mechanism of action is the micro deformation that the uh, cell polyurethane foam with a pore diameter of 400 to 600 uh, microns uh, the interaction between this and the tissue is exerting most of the effects. We're cutting the foam to fit the wound and we're, uh, we're sealing this with an adhesive drape and then we apply the, the pressure that has been uh, previously studied. This micro deformation, which is, we uh, <clears throat> think the most important mechanism of action has been beautifully illustrated in this paper published in 2004, <clears throat> where this mathematical model has been confirm with histolo histological sections uh, of uh, tissue that was treated with uh, uh, granny foam, where we can see the strut imp imprints and we see improved undulation and vascularity compared to tissue that's not treated with negative pressure wound therapy. The cell stretch and the uh, deformations, the tension forms applies on the microfilaments in the, in the tissue change, protein cellular expressions and exerts the effects that we see in the wound healing. There's a debate about which mechanism of actions, but uh, 15 years later, a uh, um, uh, paper that looks into the uh, mechanism of negative pressure wound therapy reaches the same conclusion that micro deformation is one of the most in, important uh, mechanism of actions. So when I have heard about the SNAP as a, as a therapy device, my first question is, what about the foam? How does foam the blue foam that we see in the, uh, in the SNAP device compared to the granny foam that we are familiar, that we know. <clears throat> so we see the parameters, the density, so, uh, pore size, tensile strength, airflow, they're all the same. Uh, minor difference in the foam compression force, uh, 0.3 pounds per square inch, and this is an interval. So my conclusion is that uh, the two foams are basically the same. Think again, I'm bringing this slide once again to your attention because based on what you put on the surface of the wound, it determines which of these mechanism of actions kicks in. So for example, if you don't have a sponge, you're probably not gonna have the micro uh, mechanical stimulation. You will still have removal of the fluid, the mediators, you still have edema control, you still have decreased bacteria, but you may not have some of these other effects, which some wounds, that may be okay, uh, but just think about uh, when you actively prescribe this uh, system. So I'd like to examine a couple of the trials that uh, back up the, the therapy. Uh, and this um, randomized controlled trial that was published in 2012, we have patient randomized to the SNAP versus the VAC system. 59 patients versus 56 patients. And they were followed for wound size reductions at uh, 4, 8, 12, 16 weeks. 
and we have found out that the SNAP system was not significantly different. So this basically confirms um, that we're getting the same therapy to the patients, we're getting the same effects. We have much better quality of data. Patients tolerated the SNAP device a lot easier while we're obtaining the same effects. A huge benefit was for the providers as well, the shorter dressing application times easier to use. The one drawback to this study is the spironomization. The wounds in the SNAP arm were smaller than the wound in the VAC arm, which um, it, it's interesting. That's how it's supposed to be in the reality as well. You treat the smaller wounds with the SNAP system and the bigger wounds with, with the SNAP. But this is a powerful study that shows we, we're delivering the same therapy. Uh, Kaplan-Merck's uh, couple more curves show that basically the lines are identical and we don't see a separation between so we, that we have the same effects. Uh, Dr. Marson has analyzed in this trial a subset of the previous patients only specifically venous leg ulcers. So he had 19 patients randomized to the SNAP, 21 randomized to the uh, uh, VAC and the same endpoints, but this time, when looking specifically at venous-like ulcers, we found the wound reductions in snap treated patients significantly greater than the patients with the VAC arm. 53% uh, of the patients in the SNAP arm have achieved half the size of the wound at 30 days compared to only 24% in the, in the VAC therapy. The, the same drawback as the previous study. So, so this is, this is a, a great news. We see the a separation of kaplan meier curves between the two arms. And so the conclusion is that uh, for venous leg ulcerations that are refractory, the SNAP system may be superior to electric power system. So uh, why may that be the case? Uh, uh, we know that venous stasis, one of the things that associate with that is decreased mobility. A patient that has a smaller system compared to the electrical system has much better mobility. So he's able to ambulate, walk around. Uh, uh, he's not tied up like he's on a leash. That's what usually happens with the patient on, on an electrical system. They literally like on a leash. Uh, that was possible one of the side effects, uh, one of the, the, the effects that led to, to this in, improvement in the snap arm compared to the electrical system. The trial was conducted with gauze versus sponge. There is a possible some theoretical benefits why, why gauze may be easier to use um, on um, venous ulcerations where sometimes you don't have um, uh, the significantly deep wounds and you don't need uh, the micro deformations. I, I am inclined to believe based on my experience and based on the data that uh, using a sponge on these type of wounds may have done even better. And another possible um, explanation of why the SNAP patients did better is the size of the SNAP system does allow compression. Uh, you could compress patients in an in a electrical system, but it may be a lot more difficult than, than you use them with, with, a, with a SNAP. So we're possibly seeing a synergistic effect between the negative pressure and the positive pressure, as you have uh, uh, heard Susie mentioning earlier, actually the introduction of negative pressure wound therapy has led to a new field in medicines called mechanobiology. We're early stages of that. We're, we're studying the mechanical effects on the tissue change how the tissue be behaves. So negative pressure, positive pressure. Uh, it's interesting to see what uh, we'll learn out of this. Uh, this is a patient, um, that um, I was able to treat with mechanical negative pressure wound therapy. And one of the benefits I would like to emphasize here is after excising this hematoma, I was able to apply the SNAP system in the clinic right away. Why is this important? Almost any dressing you choose after you have a freshly debridy wound will allow biofilm formation 24, 40 hours later. The drainage that that you have from the wound will allow the bacteria to grow and form the biofilm. Negative pressure wound therapy is one of the very few treatments that we have that is most effective in inhibiting biofilm formation. We actually had in this patient a quite a significant deep undermining about two centimeters here at nine o'clock and we're able to treat that. And uh, as uh, by, by contrast with the electrical system, 
uh, snap you can apply right away you don't have to wait for 30 days so I'm trying to prevent the wound from becoming chronic and then treat it I can be proactive so here five weeks later we have a flat wound closed on that closed on the minings and I can treat this patient with a micro autograft resulting in a little more than two um, um, and two months later complete closed wound with a really good cosmetic result uh, elderly patients uh, Venus stasis, not a, not a good surgical candidate, and uh, uh, she had a, a wonderful result. This is the timeline of, of her presentation. Uh, this patient, 10 pictures, they all look the same, right? <laughs> so this is a 26-year-old patient that had an ankle injury that resulted in ankle fusion. So he's lost the calf puff uh, uh, muscle pump. So he developed a pool of venous stasis on the medial aspect of his ankle. So he was sent to us of the clinic as he was having difficulty healing the uh, orthopedic incision. And we did have some progress, re reduction in size, but then we got completely stuck. This is a period of about six months. And in spite of numerous treatments, we could not make progress. We used cellular tissue products. We used collagen dressings. We used the Bremens. We're just flatlining here. And then we, uh, we decided to, to give a trial for snap therapy. We did a, a larger debridement. We applied the snap for approximately five weeks here, and we were able to put this wound on a very nice uh, trajectory, allowing it to be completely healed. Um, this is a, a very interesting slide that i like to share with you, kind of circling back to Susie's presentation at the, uh, at the beginning of the hour, where we have this patient uh, we're following in the clinic for venous leg ulcer and uh, also associated with pyoderma. That, that's not the reason I'm bringing this, this up. But he fell three days prior to seeing us in the clinic and he developed a hematoma on a tear aspect of, of his knee. And you can see how the hematoma has diffused in a sub Q and a dermis issue, but did not infiltrate in the area of the leg that was treated with the compression wrap. So you can see this line. Uh, of the hematoma. I, I, I had to share this with such a such a, a good way to visualize the effect of compression. And on this slide, uh, this is a, a venous leg also that is freshly debrided in the clinic. And as soon as we debride it, and we have to healthy uh, fresh tissue, we can see sipping of clear fluid filling up the wound bed within 30 seconds to a minute. See how it fills up. And so this is a perfect environment for growth of bacteria and developing a biofilm. So my question is for you all, who would prefer to, to use a wound vac to treat this patient? I believe this is called inferia as opposed to uh, dressings. And with this, um, it concludes our presentation.